Welcome to Maison Otaku. Come in, have a seat. We're here, we're here to talk to you a little bit about our anime fandom experiences. I'm Justin. And I'm Mike. And we'll be doing these episodes every two, yeah, every two weeks on Thursday with the goal of talking about anime. About the hobby, about, about our experiences in the hobby, and about a lot of other things. Oh yeah, we're going to cover, you know, manga, video games, models, anything else relevant to it. And every now and then, you know, just a little, some asides on some of our other hobby interests. And we've had a lot of experience in the hobby. Combined, I'd say we oh, yeah. have about 30 years, 40 years of hobby. Minimum. And we think this is going to be a very helpful to a wide variety of fans. We're going to have facts, opinions, and humor. Oh, yeah. All centered around something that's a shared passion for us and you. Yeah, now, and make no mistake, if you are a old veteran fan or some young new guy looking to see what it's all about, give us a watch. And by all means, if you are an old veteran who knows some young new kid, drag him over to the screen. we got a lot to teach him. Yes. And what's going to be a lot of fun is just the variety of things that they can learn. And this week, we're going to start with one of the great passions that Mike and I share in the hobby, which is collecting. And I think that a good way to explain the passion for collecting we both have is actually the story of how we met. Yep. Now, that was at a, a local con, a Colossal Con. That was uh, about six years ago? About six years ago. Yep. And it was a very interesting meeting. We met outside of the Mecca panel. It was a panel specifically about Mecca as girls can enjoy. Oh, yeah, yeah, that was... Well, it really turned into the girl panelists asking us, okay, guys, what the hell do you see in this? Which was an easy way for us to say, giant robots. Yeah. Dramatic stories. Manliness. Tales of square-jawed men doing square-jawed things. Unless it's Double or Zeta Gundam. Yeah. In which case, it's stories of why Camille is not nearly as interesting as Char. But that, that's another episode. <laughs> but Mike, at the time, was dressed as Ana Delgato. I was dressed as somebody without that much money. Very common cosplay at these uh, conventions, if you're not familiar. And we spoke at the con. We spoke after the con. Started hanging out, and the first time he came over to my place, he brought along a new acquisition of his, which was a copy of Black Magic M66. Yep, specifically, this is the really hard to find US rendition subtitled release with a nice case and all that. But anyway, I was pulling this out, and uh, I walked down, his apartment was a little bit dim, so I'm just walking through, I pull it out, and all of a sudden I noticed something I'd never seen on it before. Uh, put it, to put it simply, my immediate reaction was, HOLY CRAP IT GLOWS IN THE DARK! And this was, of course, my first impression of Mike outside of the guy dressed as Ana Delgato at Colossal Con. And from this I realized we'd be great friends. Because I didn't think he was the dorkiest person I'd ever met. And he was astonished somebody didn't run away from the dorkiest person they'd ever met. But these are the sort of experiences that can lead to a great lifetime in the anime hobby. Oh yeah. So, stick with us and we're going to tell you a bit about co collecting anime. What I can honestly tell you, when we talk about collecting anime, we're talking collecting anime. Yep. Not the ephemera. Ephemera is great. Figures are awesome. Models are awesome. It's all awesome. But collecting anime itself. Oh, yeah. That's fun. Th that is your bread and butter. And at many points in time, we've had great chances to collect an awful lot of anime. And that, of course, is really down to one man, Carl Masick. 
and we will say a lot about Carl Masick as we go. Mostly good, contrary to what you're probably thinking. And there have been two major popularity booms. One in the first initial blast of the VHS era, where after Streamline popped up and Animago kind of trotted alongside, you started getting Viz, US renditions, and all those following along. And then you have my personal favorite of all the booms, which was the DVD explosion of the early 2000s. Now, this is why I collect. I like such an expansive variety of anime that I can't be satisfied with just a very small amount. No. I need it all. I am a slut. Okay, no, no, I, my collection has easily reached about 2,000 units. And because of this inherent sluttiness of myself, which is giving Mike creeps right now, he is trembling at my choice of terminology, I love the DVD format. I love the bizarre assortment of companies ranging from Virgin Atlantic, who is better known as a music distributor, to Sony and Disney, who've made brief forays into distribution, to very, very tiny companies that barely made a dent in the market but released fantastic pieces. And I love that you can really chart all these little movements inside of the industry and inside of the fandom. Oh yeah. With these releases. Don't get me wrong, I love VHS a lot. VHS is where I got my start. VHS has some things that are so rare and fantastic. But DVD remains my favorite format because there is so much to experience and because it gives such great return on investment. On the other hand, Mike, you're not so big a fan of plurality and variety as you are obscurity when it comes to format choice. Well, I mean, it's certainly I enjoy the former, but yes, the latter is uh, where it's really at for me. Now, I will say here, I don't dislike DVD, I just feel it's a format that maybe not even most often, but entirely too often, fails to live up to its actually rather high potential. And without a doubt, I love VHS. There is just something nice about popping in a tape into your TV. It's, it's definitely magical, but to be honest, my favorite format is easily Laserdisc. Now, for those of you who don't know, Laserdisc was a format. Uh, we'll be going into this later, but uh, pre-DVD, giant, basically looks like a CD the size of a record. These things are great. You get these big sleeves with all gigantic cover art. You can frame these things. You get, you know, cool inserts. Uh, actually, a really interesting uh, thing about uh, Laserdisc was just, um, like, some of the things that were only released on there, like, before the DVD releases came out, you could only get the original version of Star Wars on Laserdisc if you wanted it in a digital format. It's... It's a really, really neat format for Obscura lovers. And that's partially because it is Obscura on its own. The picture quality is excellent. Yeah, it's, uh... We'll go into this more in our second part of the video where we go over format, but... It actually has similar resolution to a DVD. Most people don't realize that. It's similar. Not quite the same, but similar. Uh, but really, the great joy of Laserdisc is... Uh, just, just having the thing. Yes. It's, it's something to see. It's yeah. something to display as a collector. Well, and that's really the whole thing about you know collecting physical media. It's like the same thing with even music. You know, you hear people talk about... You know, why the heck would I want to just download all my music when I'd rather sit here, you know, listen to my CD or my record or, you know, watch my Laserdisc or whatever, and I'll have this other material with me. Uh, I've said, and I will continue to say, and I will say this now for the first time to you, the audience, why collect something that doesn't occupy a space? Yes. Why not devote space? physical space in your life to something you love. Yep. And I mean, I think when you do that, it means a lot more to you. 
It's like part of the reason people are all about disposable media is just how readily available disposable media is. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not completely downing digital media. I have about two terabytes of fan subs on my computer. I'm not going to say anything against that, but my real passion is for actually going out, digging through, you know, used bookstores or whatever for some obscure VHS tape. That's... I mean, I live for that. Yeah. And for me... I love streaming. Streaming is one of the best things to come along in the industry. By far, it's become a great way of actually interacting with the Japanese side of the industry. It's become a great way of exposing a multitude of people to many different genres. But there's just something not quite, not quite there. When it isn't there, when it yeah, isn't in your hand, it's it's almost sterile, a little bit, a little less invested, and that personal investment is what makes the treasure hunt real. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. And I mean, that is the point we're trying to get uh, hit home here. Uh, there's a lot of great things that aren't released on DVD, aren't released on Blu-ray, aren't readily available online, even in the fan sub community. Um such great gems as, you know, Robot Carnival, yes. I'm pretty sure has never seen a DVD or Blu-ray release. We did a little bit of poking around regarding various companies and their releases, and we looked up Streamline to get a little bit more footing for when we're talking with you. And Robot Carnival was one of the big pieces in the initial Streamline catalog. Oh yeah, yeah, it was one of their flagship products. And it's a great piece. If you can locate it, locate it. If you have to watch it online, by all means, yeah. watch it online. But it's a great piece that unfortunately was only available for, I won't say legitimate purchase, but that's kind of the only way you can put it, on VHS. Yep. And that's a real shame. And if you happen to be a representative from Funimation or Discotech, especially Discotech. or Sentai Film Works. You should be licensing Robot Carnival instead of watching two jokers from Ohio talk about it. Yeah. No, ser seriously, we will give you all of our money. Yes, all of his money. And that's a great example of some of the fantastic gems you can get when you go on these hunts. On the other hand, you can get Mad Bull 34. Yeah, um, we're going to do a whole episode on crap like that. But basically, Mad Bull 34 takes the sort of MST3K line, is this going to be another ultra-violent porn cartoon, which most of those I actually rather like, but it takes that and makes it not good. Yes. It makes ultra-violence and nudity boring, trite, and honestly, altogether not fun. Yeah, I was gonna say, honestly, and especially in some of the, the nudity I took, I mean, like, there's like an actually legitimate rape scene in there. It's... Yes. It's... And and keep in mind, we are not necessarily appalled by the rape scene in Akira, well, the attempted rape scene Well, in yeah, because that works. It's part of the story. It's part of the dystopian well, future. Well, on, on top of that, it's like, you have to understand my standards for what is and is not kid-friendly. In my opinion, aside from the one second of bare boobs you see in that movie, Akira is totally fine to show to a five-year-old. On the other hand, I would not show my five-year-old Mad Bull 34. He doesn't have a five-year-old. No, no, but hypothetically speaking... Yes. Were he to rent one from Blockbuster, <laughs> he would not show that five-year-old Akira. No, no, I would show him Akira, I wouldn't show him Mad Bull. Right. Yeah. But, again, Mad Bull 34. Total crap. Yeah. Not worth your time. Well, and it's like, to be honest, you even get, like, some, some shit gems. Like, I remember, um... I was, because I'm so jaded at this point it's, uh, of just like, oh god, everything that's out there that's worth seeing I've either seen or have at least heard of. And I was so freaking pumped because I walked into Half Price Books. I saw factory sealed um, VHS tapes for a buck a piece. Actually, no, it was like 89 cents a piece. And there was like, I haven't heard of these! So I just scooped them up and it's like, well, the, the main one I'm speaking of here is Princess Minerva. For any of you face-palming right now, um, yeah, but... Bought, yeah, for any of you face-palming right now, if you bought your, your Princess Minerva tape. Yeah, 
So it's absolutely freaking terrible, but at the same, it's it's kind of like that copy of Shaq Fu I got in a lot of SNES games. I like having it just so I can say I own that monstrosity. Right. It's like owning a power glove. Yeah. You're not owning it because you need a high quality peripheral. No, no, You're owning it so that you and a bunch of friends can sit around, try it, and say, wow, this is the worst way yeah. we could have used no, no, this time the, today. The power glove is not a gaming peripheral, it's a fashion statement. Yes. And the statement is, oops. It's so bad. Yes. <laughs> But, but basically, the point we're all trying we're trying to hit home here is it's all one big treasure hunt. That is why we do it. Absolutely, and you will have so much fun the, the on hunt, your hunt. Yes. The hunt really is half the fun. Now, I'm going to share with you some of our uh, experiences here going on some of these uh, formation treasure hunts. Yeah, there is, oh boy, there are some real doozies that have happened to us over the years. and But these are just the ones that really stick in our minds. Oh, yeah, yeah. That are, we hope will inspire you to get out and have some of your own, and maybe even share some of your own with us. Uh, Mike, of course, is the really, really ardent oh, yeah. collector between the two of us. And uh, this is one that he actually called me at work oh, yeah. about. Yeah, so... Now, I want to start by saying I have quite literally had dreams about things like this happening, like down to actual aesthetic details, and woke up and was depressed for the rest of the day because it didn't actually happen. As opposed to the rest of the reasons he's depressed for the rest of the day. Yes, yes. Well, yeah, it just kind of makes it worse. But anyway, uh, so we got a lead from one of our friends that there was a video store nearby uh, second-hand video store that we hadn't heard of uh, right by where I work so we're like yeah let's check it out yeah so you know um, it's worth mentioning that during the DVD boom a lot of I'll just call them what they are idiots sold a lot of their VHS tapes uh, like oh I can get it on DVD not right now and I profited greatly from this but that's been over the wells kind of been running dry lately so i was kind of only expecting to see you know maybe you know a couple things in the dollar bin worth grabbing i walk in and i see an entire wall of just pure gold these were like hardcover subtitled vhs tapes full inserts you know everything you could possibly want in these and at a pretty good price i think it was like 5.99 or two for ten which when you consider that at the height of the vhs era a tape was around forty dollars subtitled yes. two episodes of tape but most of these specific tapes i bought in fact i mean if you ever run across a fan who made it through the vhs era and actually successfully collected all of ron Mahath, Buy them a sandwich. Yes. They're poor. They are bankrupt, likely. And probably single. Possibly single. Although a lot of girls did like Ron the This is true. This is true. But you know, Mike was just so thoroughly yeah. excited. In, in fact, I walked in as I was with my cousin, and I just was like, mine, just get away. Thankfully, he was broke, so he didn't argue with us one bit. Um, I, I kind of did that, you know... It, it, it was really like something out of an 80s movie where I just grabbed a basket and was like... I bought $200 worth of VHS tapes that day. Not having $200 to spend, mind you. Uh, I kind of went that week without groceries, as I recall. Totally worth it. Yeah, there's... Sometimes you just have to go for something that is so important so monumentally outside of the norm yeah i, I need it i found an eight an old eighth man tape like the black and white eighth man series i'm never gonna see that again in my life if i don't buy it there right for me yeah, speaking of which <laughs> things that you just plain don't see uh i don't tend to be quite so extravagant i'm a little bit more uh hunt and peck, I suppose would be a good way of phrasing my collecting, because I'm more particular. I don't tend to just grab everything, I just tend to stick within my own pieces I collect. But there's a fantastic 
used DVD store that's not far from us that Mike and I were searching through at the same time. And they have a wall that is their do yeah, dollar a piece or 15 for 10 wall. Mostly uh, video store slash rental store cast off. About 10 different copies of Godzilla, like the U.S. Godzilla movie, or... Yeah. A good way to collect more than one copy of, say... Uh... Really, pick your generic action movie. They have at least six different copies of it. Yes. If you wanted Nicholas Cage yeah, yes. circa 1998, yeah, go they to got this it. wall. They got you covered, bro. And... Mike was first at the wall. Which, etiquette dictates. Mike is first to the wall. He gets whatever gets found first. Regardless of whether or not I wanted it more, he gets it yes. first. So he's moving along. And I'm one row of shelves behind him. And these are shows. You know, these are shelves going floor to ceiling, about nine shelves high. Easily. And... Now, it's important to point out here that... They're all, like, all you can see are the end labels. They're not, like, laid flat. So you have to really pick through these nine shelves worth. Yeah. It's a good way to kill a couple of hours if you don't have somebody waiting for you. Yeah. And Mike had already gone, and it's a corner section. And Mike had already turned the corner. And <laughs> I'm I done, following. Yeah, I done fucked up. Done goof. Because at that corner again. He's at one side of the corner, I'm at the other side of the corner, and I go three shelves down, and I just pull a DVD off the shelf, and turn to him and say, Hey Mike, didn't you want this? And I'm just like, No! What? You bastard! It was Urdase Yatsura Beautiful Dreamer, probably the best of the Urdase Yatsura movies. Oshi at his most Oshi, Namiko Takahashi still having original ideas, Neither of which has happened again in the past, in the following 15 years. The VHS is decently rare, but you, you still can find it pretty. I've seen a few copies. The DVD copy is practically unheard of, and here it is for a dollar. Yeah, there, there's there. You can, I'm ah. sure there's there were Egyptian pharaohs that were easier to find yeah. than this. And it was mine. He missed it. It's mine. I love the movie. I've always loved the movie. But Mike is a huge UI collector. Oh, God, yes. And that he missed what he did not already own in plain sight. I mean, plain oh. sight to a well, plain, collector. Yeah, yeah. Was so Delicious. I was, <laughs> I was savoring his unhappiness. I, I then began plotting to kill him and take it for my own. But... And he is still planning to kill me. It will probably be filmed on yeah, screen that's for an, you. That's another episode, though. Yeah, probably sweet for Yeah. We'll we'll get an we'll get an Oscar out of that. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Do they give Oscars for YouTube videos? No, I don't. They might. You will give us an Oscar for my death. Yeah, we're, we're totally bitching about anime on the internet for any kind of recognition. Yes. And I suppose recognition is a really interesting word to bring yeah. up when you're discussing this because there's no value. Yeah. There's rarity. There's mm. scarcity. Yeah, no, there's value. Just there's no monetary value. It's yeah. This stuff really is worth whatever someone's willing to pay. Yeah. We're probably another... 10 to 15 years away from any form of speculator boom. And even that's kind of a... Uh, it's, it's hopeful a, at best, a hopeful I would say. hopeful at best statement. And not even really a hopeful statement, because the speculator booms it did so much damage to... Oh, God, yeah. It did so much damage to comic books in the early 90s. It did a lot of damage to action figures oh, the in the card 80s. market just went belly up. It fractured the sports card market in the 80s and 90s. We're glad, in some respects, that this hobby hasn't had a speculator boom. But at the same time, not having a speculator boom has caused a lot of yeah, yeah, objects to go missing. Long story short, 
it's great because you can get, as long as you're not buying from another collector, you can get amazing things at dirt cheap prices, especially if you're buying for someone who specifically doesn't know what they have. Just um, don't get into this expecting to get rich off of it, because chances are you won't. No. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's a good hobby to stay in, because it is an act of devotion. And we both have our own personal devotion, you know, Ahab moments, okay. where we are just going to accomplish this regardless of what it means in the grand scheme of things, which is precious little. Yep. In Mike's case, that's his UY collection. Yeah, um, very long story short, I started collecting it because I realized I don't have this great series, haven't seen much of it, and rightstuff.com had deep, brand new DVDs for dirt cheap, so I started buying about two a week. Then some stuff came up that, quite frankly, you don't need to know about, and I ran out of money. By the time I got the funds once more to purchase two DVDs a week, um, they had been since discontinued. I grabbed up what was left on there, but the last volumes I needed, uh, people were charging outrageous prices for on eBay. Um, in one, the highest I've seen, I think it go for was volume 50. I think was a couple times listed at about 900 to 1,000 uh, dollars. But uh, on average, people were asking one to two hundred dollars a DVD. I think the most, I, the least I ever paid for one on there was uh, thirty-five or forty bucks plus shipping off of eBay. And occasionally, you do just have to bite the bullet yeah. when you're looking for something you really, truly want. Mike just happened to bite more bullets. Well, than... yeah, it, it's worth pointing out if you're not familiar. Urusei Yatsura is two hundred episodes long. Uh, on DVD format, it was released. Four episodes a disc, equaling 50 discs. Plus, uh, let's see, it's like 12 or 13 OVA episodes and six movies. Well, anyways, my act of devotion was eventually getting all of that. The last thing I need to complete the collection is movie number five, I think. And his moment of completion is... A long time coming, but fantastic. And it's not because he hasn't seen it all, but it's because it's that important. Yeah, to I mean, I I downloaded the whole series off of the internet, but I still wanted to collect the rest of it at great expense to myself. Mm -hmm. For myself, uh, my act of devotion is still going on, and it's kind of hysterical because I'm I've been in the hobby for quite a long time. The very first thing I ever saw was Project Aiko. Oh, yeah. And you want to talk about the wrong end of the hobby to start out in. I went Project Aiko, then Dominion Tank Police, then Bubblegum Crisis. And when you start at that block, your tastes are infinitely skewed away from the mainstream. Well, uh, yeah, but you are definitely in love with it. Yeah, I wouldn't even say that's the wrong end. It's very much the right end. It's just... It's the wrong end if you're looking to be popular, but I don't think really anyone goes into this looking for popularity. And if you do, you are a horribly confused individual. Yes, this, this is not what you do. You do not get chicks doing this. Sadly, no. chicks can get guys doing this. But that, that's another episode. Yeah, that, yeah. That's entirely different. Uh, now... However, one of the shows I had the best experiences watching that really kind of grabbed me because of the way it was presented to me was, in fact, Gundam Wing. And don't get me wrong, I am UC. I am very UC. After all, my best friend I met because, hey, that's Anna Velgato. And I knew it was where he was Anna Velgato. Yeah, shaved, hair silver, the whole nine yards. But Gundam Wing is a lot of fun, and it happened to have been on while I was in high school, and I had a lot of anime-watching friends while I was in high school, so we could sit at the lunch table each day after seeing an episode and discuss what happened in the episode. And that was just a fun time for me. And, of course, the DVDs were coming out at that time, 
and they were the the single volume DVDs, of which there are ten. And as a high school student, I was collecting these DVDs as best I could with the meager funds I had, and I only got as far as disc four before I got distracted by other expensive things. <laughs> More stuff will gloss over. Yeah. And since then, I've always decided that as a tribute to that very fun time in my life, I would collect the collection that I started on, not one of the later thin packs, one of the complete collections that are better releases in terms of finance, in terms of packaging and so forth. But the original release because that's what I want. That's what best reflects how important Gundam Wing was for me at that time in my circle of friends, in my experience as a fan. And right now I'm up to disc seven. And I'm three discs away. And the reason why I haven't simply gone on Amazon to get those last three discs is because that doesn't reflect what I was doing. I want to have them in my hands physically, give cash to the person who has that disc, and take it home and put it on my shelf in the order of disc that you know, that they were in. I have passed up disc 8 because I didn't have disc 6. I have passed up disc 9 because I didn't have di you know, disc 5. Now, I must point out, that's a... That's a a Justin thing, I don't adhere to that. A lot of my stuff I acquired through random scattered volumes, but like he said, this is something he set out to do. Yes, it's something I am doing specifically in this fashion because it's the way I want to do it, not because it's the easiest way or the best way or even the way that's... Yeah, even, the per yeah. even a way that wouldn't necessarily land me in therapy. Possibly it is a personal form of therapy. Um, but it's important. Yeah. And it's important because it's a reflection. It's a personal reflection. It's an artistic reflection oh, yeah. Yeah, of definitely. the love a person can have for art itself. Art should reflect art, if that isn't too pretentious. No, I, 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 I think collecting it, it's appropriate here, at least. But yeah, it's it's. Well, I, I think he kind of hit a keynote there. It's it's therapeutic. It's in a world where we have much less control over anything that we want, we can look into the seething torrent of chaos that is um, collecting uh, out-of-production media and make sense of it because we have those skills, because we have that experience. So winding things down now, I'm going to introduce to you a segment we're doing. Uh, every episode, where we will take turns introducing to you something that we want to recommend. Now, Justin, I believe this week you've brought something very near and dear to both our hearts. Oh, absolutely. Uh, both Mike and I are fans of this franchise, and I am introducing an entire franchise that's available as a manga, two different anime forms, and an obscure Super Nintendo game. And that's Kaoru Shintani's Area 88. If you aren't familiar with the storyline, Area 88 is about a fictional Arabic country named Azran, mm -hmm. wherein there's this huge civil war that's been fought for many, many years for undisclosed reason, yeah, reasons. And in order to fight this civil war, they hire mercenary pilots. And the mercenary pilots they hire come from all around, got a contract, and through a, set, a series of really shady circumstances, Japanese pilot Shin Kazuma is brought into Area 88, locked into a contract against his will, and uses his phenomenal piloting skills to shoot his way out of Area 88 through his contract. And there's so much that can be said about the series as a whole. First off, the most common form is the ABV release recent TV series, which adds a somewhat needless photographer character. <laughs> well, no, he, he was in there before, it's just he now is a main character for yeah. some reason. Somewhat needless photographer character who was in the manga, 
but now he's a main character for reasons that are completely ridiculous, but he does serve to kind of tie around the story. The CGI that's used to animate the aircraft is good. It It is a complete CGI fest, but which I usually hate, but if you're going to do a CGI fest, at least make it look like this. Yeah, using the CGI as a way to have great detail, good cell shading, it does look good. The character designs actually work out quite well. Shin is very well realized. Uh, Greg is very well realized. The whole show takes the characters very well, takes the aircraft very well, gives everything great personality and has a good soundtrack. We are a little bit more partial to the older OVA, oh, yeah. which really only covers the very, very first bits of the manga because they were new. Well, it, it, it kind of pulls a Nausicaa where it covers the first parts of the manga and then shoots to the end. Yeah. And that's a shame. And admittedly, the art is much more of the time, but not quite as much of the manga. And it's, it's still very good. It's still very good. It's just, if you want purity to the manga, you're not quite going to get it from the OVA. Well, you're not going to get it for, from either, really. You're not going to get really either, true enough. Because Kaoru Shintani, the art in this is phenomenal. But it's oddly shoujo. You bit. could go from Rose of Versailles to Area 88 and swear you were reading the same thing if you were just going off of pictures until you came to an extraordinarily detailed drawing of an F-8 Crusader. Yes. And that's really kind of one of the, the great things about it is you have these flowing shoujo-esque character designs doing phenomenally shonen things. Yeah. And that's really just the visual juxtaposition that's fun. The stories are great. There's this wonderfully repeating theme of man at his breaking point, ideal versus situation. Just a lot of really great, interesting things that are a kind of distinctly Japanese perspective mm. on war and what it does to people. And as far as availability, the ADV TV series is going to be your best bet for easiest to find. A note on that, though, go and get the fan subs of it because the ADV, ADV did not get the rights to the original uh, theme music except for the opening theme. And if you're like into trance techno or anything like that, all the it, it's trance techno to aerial dogfight sequences. You, I just, I'm sorry, that just strikes a note with me. But so the fan subs are superior in that version, but the ADV releases are not bad. The other great things, the OVA, not hard to find. It was a U.S. manga core release, so it's out there. It's something you can definitely find. You won't have to pay too much for it. Uh, it's available VHS and DVD. Uh, the TV series is available DVD, both singular release and complete series release, like I just showed you. The manga, on the other hand, if you want a challenge, find the manga. It's fantastic, but it only went through one printing. It didn't make it to the right to left revival. So you only have it in left to right oversized like this, which is still a good format for seeing the art. Well, you also have it in a 32 page American comic style release, which I actually stumbled upon most of that. Yes. And that's another really great way to collect it as an artifact as an oddity not so much for the stories i mean some of the stories are pretty well contained to that but there's a lot of will shin make it <laughs> by the next issue which really does spoil a lot of what shintani was really trying to say uh, but if you find these pick them up they're so worthwhile they're so fantastic you will not get a better series about aerial combat and the men who engage in it than Area 88, unless you get the cockpit. Yes, which we recommend also. Yes. And I think now having said that Leiji Matsumoto was superior to something. Yes. We've given our best note upon which to end yes. for this week. Well, from us here at Maison Otaku, thanks for visiting. This is Mike. And Justin saying, enjoy what you watch.
and share what you enjoy. Adult! 